Welcome to the first and only District 11 Democrat primary debate. The challenger, Mr. Tim Curtis. Hello. And the incumbent, Representative Castor. As you can see, this is a replica of Ms. Castor. She has declined every offer from the Curtis campaign to have a debate. Okay, so let's get started. First, we're going to have opening statements by the candidates. Mr. Curtis, you go first. Thank you, and thank you all for being here today. This is one of the most historic opportunities that we're going to face in this nation for some time. There is a great opportunity to demonstrate in, on August 24th that we expect change in real change, real reform. The direction and the policies and the principles that have been espoused by this Congress and the incumbent are in opposition to nearly 90% of our nation. There is a clear difference that folks have to make, or a clear choice that folks have to make on August 24th, and I would ask for your support and your vote in the Democrat primary on August 24th. Thank, Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Castor, your opening statement? Oh, okay. Well, we'll move on then. Okay. We're going to start with questions. And our first question is from Shelly. The Bradenton Herald endorsed Ms. Castor. How do you respond to that endorsement? Thank you for the question. And it's very important that we make, uh, again, a clear distinction about endorsements. And while the incumbent has been endorsed by this newspaper and a couple of the other newspapers around, I've got to tell you that having walked thousands and thousands and thousands of homes throughout the 11th Congressional District, I'm proud to stand before you today and tell you that I have the endorsement of the voters, the voice of the people. They've told me their concerns and they want me to carry that message to Washington, D.C. And so I'm much more grateful to have the endorsement of the people who really matter rather than a few elite media types who don't have any clue what it means to get out and meet the folks in the neighborhood or in the district and then really reflect their opinion. I have the endorsement of the people that I choose that I'm hoping to serve. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Representative Castor, same question. All right, we'll move on. Uh, the next question is from Junior. What are your plans to heal the economy? Again, a, a very important question. I don't know that there's a more important question that we face. Uh, on August 24th, the person who goes to Washington uh, in, in the general election is going to be faced with some tough choices. And I can tell you that there is one thing that constitutionally Congress can do that will have an impact on every area of the economy, first and foremost, will be in job creation. You see, the federal government doesn't create jobs. They hire people in the public sector, but they don't create jobs. That is the function of the private sector. But the one thing that Congress can do within their constitutional powers is to affect tax policy. Now, at the end of this year, all of our taxes are going to go up unless we have new leadership in Washington that puts a stop to that. The impending tax increase will absolutely kill an already struggling economy, and I challenge anyone to convince a person who's out of work that there is any such thing as a jobless recovery. To that person who's looking for a job, to that person who's unemployed or underemployed, there is no such thing as a jobless recovery. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Tim. Uh, Ms. Castor, same question. All right, we'll move on. Uh, third question is from Deb. Um, Congress is spending a lot of money. What are your intentions when you get to Washington? Well, this is, a, again, thank you for the question. This, this isn't a new problem. You see, it, we've never had a revenue problem in Washington. We've always had a spending problem. 
And the bottom line, very simply, is that Congress is spending irresponsibly and recklessly. And I don't want to just hand, leave it off at that. I'll give you a very specific example of where the reckless spending is occurring. Just last week, it was reported that Congress has, has voted to continue to subsidize first-class passenger tickets on Amtrak train. Now, Amtrak is, is subsidized by the federal government. I understand that. However, to extend that subsidy to first-class passengers at the expense of the people who otherwise probably truly need the help is the irresponsible and reckless spending that I'm referring to. So the very first thing we're going to do, if we're going to talk about moratoriums, let's talk about putting a moratorium on the irresponsible and reckless spending that's being engaged in by the incumbent and this Congress. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Ms. Castor, any response? Okay, we'll move along. Question number four is from Mark. Uh, what is your position on the waste and corruption in Washington? Uh, sir, that's, that's an absolutely terrific question, and certainly in the last two weeks, three weeks, when we hear about uh, the things that are going on uh, with respect to people that have failed to pay their taxes, people who have used their personal influence to enrich uh, family members, the, the idea of honor and integrity seemed to be completely absent in this Congress. We were told under the new leadership that we were going to drain the swamp. Well, the alligators and snakes seem to still be there. The bottom line is that as a Democrat, I want to return credibility to the claim of honor and integrity when it comes to leadership in Washington, D.C. I spent 20 years in the United States Marine Corps. I know what it means to operate under the principles of honor and integrity, and that's exactly what I'll do when I get to Washington. Thank you. Okay, Tim. Ms. Castor, uh, do you have anything to say about that or any other topic we've discussed? All right, we'll move along. Uh, fifth question is from Bill. Yes, I noticed on uh, some of your signs you've got this uh, constitutional Democrat. Can you explain uh, to us in the Democratic Party what, it, what that means? Certainly, and, and that's a fair question because I've been challenged on my credentials as a Democrat. I'm not sure I understand that, but let me explain to you what I mean when I say a constitutional Democrat. On February 24th, 1975, eight days after my 18th birthday, I registered to vote as a Democrat in Temple Terrace, Florida. And I was a registered Democrat from that day through my entire Marine Corps career. During that whole period of time, I took an oath as a Marine and as a Marine officer to uphold and defend the Constitution. That is what I did for 20 years in the United States Marine Corps. It is what I do now as a Democrat, and it is what I will do in Congress as a constitutional Democrat. I will actually abide by, support, and defend the freedoms that the Constitution guarantees to us all. Thank you. Thanks, Tim. Uh, Ms. Castor, anything? No? Okay. All right, the final question, Tim, is for me. Our current representative has not been very accessible lately. Can you promise us that you will be? Uh, thank you, sir, for the question. And the simple, straightforward answer to that is absolutely, yes, I will. Uh, I'd like to elaborate because here's my pledge to you today that I will hold quarterly town hall meetings in several areas within the district because the district geographically is very big and it's very diverse. So I absolutely will be both accessible and accountable and I'm going to go back to my Marine Corps career where as a United States Marine and as a service member serving in the armed forces of our country, I know what it means to be accountable. And as a leader of Marines, I also know what it means to be accessible to those folks that I hope to serve by being your representative in Congress. So the very simple, straightforward answer is yes, I will be both accountable 
and accessible to the people who I hope to serve. Okay, that's all the questions we have. We do want to give the candidates time for closing statements. So, Kath, uh, Ms. Castor, would you like to go first with closing statements? Uh, Tim, I guess she doesn't want to speak, so you go ahead and go. Thank you very much. And I want to thank you all for being here again. It's my great privilege, my great honor to be here. And it's also a very humbling experience to come to you and ask you for your vote and your support. So thank you so much for doing this, for holding this very important debate. And it is the only time that the voters of the 11th Congressional District in the Democrat primary are going to have the opportunity to have a side-by-side -side comparison. You see, the incumbent and I have very, very different visions, very different values for where we want to take this country. I'm a proud retired Marine. I'm a father. I'm a uh, grandfather. And I've served in our community. And I see this nation of people who, when given the opportunity, will do things unimaginable. They accomplish great things for their families, for their community, and for us as a whole, as a nation. And what we're looking for and what they're looking for is not so much a handout from the government, or not even a hand up. What they're really wanting is a handoff. They want a handoff of their back that's holding them down from being able to grow to greatness. They want a handoff of their pocketbook through the onerous taxes that are about to go up again. They want a handoff of their backs, and Congress and the incumbent are completely out of control and out of touch with what the American people, and more specifically, we as Democrats within the 11th Congressional District want and need in order for us to be able to provide the kind of future for our families that we all hope for. So, with that in mind, we have the opportunity to make a very, very clear, send a very, very clear message to Washington, D.C. on August 24th. And with that, I'd like you to ask to vote, I'm asking you to vote for me, Tim Curtis, Democrat, for Congress. Thank you.